Okay, so then Alvin dies. Alvin's final words to Joseph. Well, yeah. So Joe Smith goes once to the hill to get the plates uh, from the guardian spirit. In 1823. In 1823. Yes. Okay. 1823. He says he's going to the hill to get the plates, but he has to not come home with the plates because he has no plates. So just like not finding any of the treasures, right? He doesn't bring the the, uh, plates home. But they're more, Joseph Sr. is likely to believe his son's excuse when the treasure guardian prevented him, shocked him, threw him back when he touched the plates, threw him back just like a treasure guardian would, his father is likely to believe that because he he's, believes all these other things about treasures sinking, slipping into the earth already. Okay. So this is important because a lot of people want to know who's an accomplice and who's a sincere believer. Mm-hmm. And you're telling me Joseph Smith <clears throat> Sr. and Alvin believed in spirits, believed mm-hmm. that there was a golden plates, an ancient record, right. and believed that Joseph had power. Mm-hmm. Not a bunch of family members all in on a conspiracy at that point. Correct? Right. No, no conspiracy ever. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so Alva dies. Uh, Lucy joins the Presbyterian Church. Joseph flirts with Methodism. Mm-hmm. Joseph gives the stone back to the chases. Right. Joseph tries to make good. He apologizes or repents for his fraudulent acts or whatever. But, but what he found out was uh, he tried to use the same ploys on Methodist or ministers. It says he was in the company of a, a, a one of the ministers, and he told him his first vision story, right? But it wasn't his first vision story that he told the minister because there was no first vision story with a like God that. and a Jesus, right? Yeah, there's none of that. He what he told the minister was about the gold plates and the guardian spirit, and the and the minister responded by saying there isn't any revelations anymore. God doesn't, you know, meaning the Bible's all there is. And this is the same minister that said Alvin was in hell, right? Yeah. Okay. Right? Well, no. No? Good we don't me. know. He doesn't name that minister. Sorry. Okay. 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 It could have just been Willard Chase, because Willard Chase is in the, in the census as a Methodist minister. Okay. Methodist clergy or some sort of thing. But he might have been a lay, what okay. Methodists call a lay minister. I was he, it could have just was... been him, you know? And he, he was saying, oh, I don't believe in those slippery treasure stories. You know, he believes in the stones, but he doesn't believe in slippery treasures. But uh, that could have all, there, there could have been just that. He, jo, jo Smith's telling saying that he told the, meth, the minister, not Methodist, but the minister, about the first vision is just not be- credible. But the response of the minister is not... Uh, oh, yeah, sure, you saw God. No man could see God and live, <laughs> maybe. But he isn't going to say, oh, there's no more revelations nowadays, like in the sense of the Book of Mormon, you know, or that there's a, a book, you know, that's going to give you answers to things beyond the Bible. Okay. So, so he goes back in 1824 and... He comes home and says, I couldn't get them this time because I was supposed to bring Alvin, the the guardian spirit. And we know it's a guardian spirit, not an angel, by the way, because angels... That evolves. That that gets added to the story later. But angels aren't mortals. They're special creations of God. Right. Okay. Okay. That's the way angels were until Joseph Smith redefined them later as an angel... Is uh, can be a, a, a mortal, right? Okay. Okay, but uh, and did he call spirit. him Moroni or Nephi at the time? Oh, no, Do we know? Probably no name. In 1823, 1824. Yeah, probably okay. no name. Okay. Until later. Okay. Um, but he tells his family, "I couldn't in 1824. I couldn't find." They it. know it's an uh, you know, an ancient Indian type person, but a spirit. It's but, a spirit. A spirit, sorry, I keep saying angel. But they want him to find the plates. They're like, where are the plates? Go yeah, get the yeah, plates. Yeah. Alvin's like, make sure and find the plates. Like everybody right. is believing Joseph and expecting him to retrieve the plates. But, yeah. he, but he couldn't a second time in The second time he comes home and he says, I didn't get them because I couldn't bring Alvin. Right. And it, the spirit had instructed me to bring Alvin. 
And you ask in your book, you would think the spirit would have known that Alvin was going to die when he made that request. Really? <laughs> well, that's the, the trick. Next year. That's the trick. That's spirits. <laughs> these these spirits do tricky things. Oh, okay. They always, in, when you read money lore, they're always promising, do this, do that. And then, and then the spirit, I tricked you. you know? uh, it's like a leprechaun, like a, yeah. like Rumpelstiltskin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so I couldn't bring Alvin. There is this uh, um, strange uh, passage in the Wayne Sentinel right at this time that says, Joe Smith Sr. Joe Smith Sr. posted this uh, notice that he had dug Alvin's body up, and because he heard rumors that uh, Alvin had been dug up and dissected, and he dug up dug Alvin up, which you could probably tell if it had been recently dug up, but um, he dug up Alvin. And who, some, who did? Joe Smith Sr. Right, and you you also say in your book that maybe he was hoping some plates were in there, right? No. That they were going to take Alvin's body to the Hill Camorra or a piece of him. So that's speculation. To get the place. That's Quinn. To Quinn, get the place. That's Quinn talks about this in his book. The timing is really odd. And so nobody knows exactly what was going on, but the dissection story doesn't ring true. And the timing of digging him up just days before Joe Smith to go to the hill. Okay. Or at just after. The exact date is also a later thing. But um, uh, anyway, when Joseph Smith failed to get the plates this time, that was it. He got tricked. And so that's 1824, 1825. He's in the revival. So he repented. Right. Years go by and he doesn't think of this thing in the hill until 1827. And that's where the Book of Mormon... After he has to give up money digging. Okay, so we'll come back to the Book so of Mormon. So we have to do the 1826 trial. Before then, yeah. So yeah. What, what gets Joseph Smith back into treasure digging in 1825 after he gave it up? It's, well, uh, I don't know if it Josiah Stoll, right? I don't know if it exactly coincides with that, but in October 1825, mm -hmm. Josiah Stoll comes all the way from uh, South Bainbridge, New York, which is way, you know, 100, 100 miles, something like that. And he probably heard about Joseph Smith's gift from his son, Simpson Stoll, who lived in Manchester at this time. And According to Josiah Stoll's testimony during the trial, uh, Joe Smith actually came to his uh, Simpson Stoll's house and demonstrated his remote viewing skills um, where he looked into his stone and could describe uh, Josiah Stoll's farm, uh, a hand painted on a tree. Probably somebody stuck their hand in white paint maybe and touched the tree and... Um, outhouses, it says. We don't know exactly uh, what Joe Smith said. All we know is that what Joe Smith, uh, what Josiah Stowe believed he was describing, because if you go to, psych you study psychics today, uh, which was another hobby I, I didn't ever mention that I did magic <laughs> when I was a kid, but um, if you study psychics, you find in cold readings the person that, that responds to what the psychic's saying interpret, actually interprets what they think the psychic said. So the person being read is, is uh, participating in the phenomenon. So the psychic might say something very general, like, uh, this person died because I feel something around the chest area, and they'll go, oh yeah, he died of cancer, lung cancer. And then if you ask the person later, well, what did the psychic do? And he'll say, the psychic said my uncle died of lung cancer, but he never said that. The person interpreted that. So the problem... Yeah, the person fed them the information. Right, exactly. But then forgot. <laughs> well, yeah. And remembered it. That, yeah. Yeah. And it was so, and, and the, the other phenomenon is that they will forget all the misses when a psychic 
is fishing they'll and finally hit something they'll remember the hits and forget about all the misses and for me this goes and so back there, to- with josiah still there could be many misses and then joe smith could have failed here and there and they just recede back into history the the hits are remembered and to history and then that gets put down in the record, and you think, oh, this guy's amazing. Yeah. But for me, the two things are number <clears throat> one is that you, you talk about this in your book that people, and you mentioned this in the past episode, people want to believe in special powers because they're scared, they're fearful of death, they want to feel like they have control in, in their lives, and they want to feel some sense of security and comfort. Yeah. And that's the religious impulse. And that's what would fuel someone's willingness to empower a, a, a seer or a um, one of these cold readers or uh, you know mystics or mediums or whatever. Mm-hmm. But but the other thing that's important to me is just Joseph Smith is doing the sorts of stuff that a, a you know crystal ball you know what are those people called that do fortune tellers right yeah. These, yeah or mediums that try and tell people and speak to their dead for them. That's, again, the type of stuff Joseph Smith was involved in. Right. How to make a person think that you know all about them when you just met them. And, and that's that's and, what a psychic reader does. And people believe in that to this day. Thoughtful yeah. ex-Mormons. But he was a great reader of people. You, even his later career shows that. Right. And so that's how he convinced Josiah Stoll that he had powers, along with whatever his he reputation was. He was convinced was. and hired him on the spot. Right, And so he and Joseph Smith Sr. marched off with Josiah Stoll. They went to South Bainbridge's home. And 1825. Then, 1825. And then they got down to Harmony, Pennsylvania. Uh, they're, they're traveling down the Susquehanna River, actually. Josiah Stoll lives on the Susquehanna River. They're traveling down to what is called the Great Bend of the Susquehanna, where it kind of curves. And right in this bend is this Harmony and it's now called Oakland, uh, Pennsylvania. And they hook up with uh, Isaac Hale, and Isaac Hale boards them. Emma's dad. Emma's father. And there's a company, and they sign a, uh, an agreement on how the, the treasure will be divided. Now, so, so I, three so, summers. So Josiah Stoll hires him yeah. because there's rumors that there's a silver mine yeah, that had been buried by Spaniards right. in the area where Isaac Hale lives. Yeah, correct. Traveling up the Susquehanna River, and so there, there's this company that says we'll divide up the shares. Once we find the silver treasure, well, this is how we'll divide it. And Joseph yeah. and Joseph Senior Junior, do you say two out of nine shares they got or something like that? I think I read something, that. In your book. I forget. Okay. So they're, they're already divided. dividing up the spoils before it's even yeah. found, <laughs> which shows they really believe there's gonna they're gonna and find even, something. Even Isaac Hale. Right. So at this po- <laughs> at this point, okay, okay, Isaac Hale. So they've been there for three summers before this, and that's something Melanarchus makes a point about the death of somebody that maybe that person was killed, and maybe Joseph Smith. She kind of tries to implicate Joseph Smith in a murder relating to this company of so treasure Jason seekers. Treadwell. Yes. Yeah, Jason Treadwell lived uh, up a ways in Windsor, which is where my relatives originated. Uh, in Windsor before they moved further up in, into New York. But the next township across the state line is Windsor and there Jason Treadwell. This is 1824, but, uh, and Quinn tries to make it sound like Joe Smith was there before, but... You don't believe that? No. So you don't want to tie the death of that guy to Joseph Smith? No, well, later in Harmony, Pennsylvania, in, in the histories of Harmony, Pennsylvania, 1877, Emily Blackwell, Blackman, excuse me, Blackman, um, wrote a history of Susquehanna County, and she gives these rumors about, the thing was is that they couldn't get the treasure, and they needed to have a sacrifice, a human sacrifice. And then Jason Treadwell died, and... They said, oh, okay, that's the it. But it, Joseph Smith, though, said, no, it, it, a um, sheep, a black sheep will be good enough. And, um, but these are all like later and where they're, they're meshing. They're not so good at their chronology as they should be. 
and they get it all wrong. And my only question is, do you <clears throat> do you think Joseph Smith was tied to the murder of no. Treadwell? He okay. wasn't even around. That's okay. He didn't even know Josiah Stoll. Okay. Uh, he didn't know Isaac Hale. Quinn and, tries to make it sound like there are like folk lore of Smith being in the area, but it's another Smith, I believe, that was a lumberjack Smith that was a lot older. And uh, it wasn't... The R. Joseph Smith. It was okay. a different guy. For, and, as far as you believe. Yeah. Okay. Well, and plus, in the trial, he says he's been using this stone for three years. And um, that would be like 1822. And uh, this is the stone that he's using. And Josiah mentions how long he's known him in the trial and it's after the... Yeah, it's just... Okay. okay, that's fine. For the last six months, you know, it, it just doesn't gel for me for Joe Smith to be there uh, other than what we okay. know. Okay, that was just a question. Okay, so back to the... They create the company to find the silver mine boarding at Isaac Hills. How does it go? Yeah, so well, so in in the... After they ride up their little treasure thing on in November of 1825, it's getting kind of cold, but they... Trapes up the hill, and I've been on this hill, I mean, a couple of times, trying to look for the holes, <laughs> but they went up the side of this hill, a bluff, and they started digging in the this one area. Okay, there was a, already a target place because there was a seeress, uh, Odal, that's all we know is her name was Odal. And she had used a stone and found treasure. And for three summers, Josiah Stoll had made the trip and dug. There's been three companies at least. But he was there at least the last summer before he met Joseph Smith. Then he brought Joseph Smith, let Joseph Smith try to do it. This seeress failed. So Joseph Smith locates it on the high part of this bluff. And they start digging this huge hole, according to their tradition there in that area. Emily Blackman, mostly. She later drew, drew where the holes were. But after they dug and they couldn't find anything, Joe Smith looks in his stone and he says it slid down the hill to another location. They start digging there. Okay, wait. How big were these holes? This first hole was something like 30 feet in diameter, they say. You know, the drawing. It even had a drainage ditch to drain out the water if, if it rained. But the other holes are smaller. Okay. And one of them's just, uh, there's a picture of this hole uh, by um, Edwards. The photographer, 18, I mean, 19, about 1919 or 19. So they have pictures. Yeah, there's pictures of a guy standing in the, and it's written on the bottom, money hole. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> up on the side of the hill. And, uh, and another picture, you could see it's in a clump of bushes looking down the hill, and you can see the house where Joe Smith used to live. But um, so it was within walking distance up this hill. And um, so they've been since like filled in so the cattle won't fall in and right. uh, things like that. But And so there was the first hill, then Joseph said it slipped, the first hole, then Joseph said it slipped away. Yeah. Then there was a second hole. Yeah. And, keep... and it's quite possible they did an animal sacrifice, you know, during this. A goat or a sheep or yeah. a dog or yeah. something. But not a human sacrifice. That's all distorted stuff that happened later. Okay. But the, the, the Lewis brothers, Joseph and Heil Lewis, who were cousins of Emma, lived within sight of these holes, they said. And they were quite young when it happened, younger than Joe Smith. And uh, they uh, are the ones that said there was a bleeding ghost. And they, the, these legends in this area even mixed up that the gold plates were in that hill. So you know they've got stuff wrong. But... Um, but I believe they're probably right about the Spanish ghost with the neck cut. Uh, you know, they tried to make it out to be like Moroni or something, but I believe it was there that 
the the ghost that was guarding that treasure on that hill there that's probably true and it was an iron chest and you know bleeding a bleeding ghost because because this would go back to the kid stuff of he killed someone and and then that spirit would be yeah. guarding it so right so it's it's just the new lore created for that specific hill and that specific treasure mm -hmm. uh, and it's spaniard because it was spanish silver right mm -hmm. okay right. So how so they do the second digging and then how does it progress? It just slid slides again. Keep sliding. Then um, Isaac Hale started getting uh, disenchanted with the money digging company, and especially Joseph Smith Jr., who obviously was having romantic notions about his daughter, and he wanted them to leave. and And Joseph Smith, in his history, tries to make it seem like he talked the old gentleman Josiah Stoll out of not looking for it. Then the thing about Justice Smith's history is that he obfuscates on his role in the whole thing. He never mentions, there's no mention of him uh, having a seer stone, no mention of him being the leader saying where to dig. He's just, he makes it sound like he's just one of the diggers just tagging along. And for some reason, one of these digger, why did Josiah Stowe go all that way to get a, a, a digger, you know? And... Um, bring him there and then listen to him when he says it's time to quit. I mean, it just, it's a total farce how he writes it. So he, he, his history at this point is deceptive. It's out and out. And untrue. he even would admit that because he gave it up once and apologized. And later he gives it up again after he gets in trouble and he promises to Isaac Hale he'll stop. So yeah, he's hiding, so, but he's hiding his re the real role he in his history he doesn't want to mention anything right, about right. seer stones of course. he only wants to talk about the urim and thummim right right so yeah <laughs> the, you know the spectacles right you know right. so um <clears throat> okay so so it's about a month that they're that they're digging for this silver mine right is that right close yeah it's about a month okay and and again, every time, from what I read in your book, every time it's always slipping, it's always being removed. Right. And eventually Joseph starts complaining that his eyes hurt. Yeah. And ultimately, what does he claim in terms of what ends the dig? No, uh, uh, probably Isaac Hale getting uh, upset. But he tries to say that he prevailed upon the old gentleman to give up the project. But doesn't he also say something about like the spirit removing it so it just can't be found anymore? It's just been, well, he, it's well, beyond my power. Okay. At some point he's saying it's beyond my power. According right? to Isaac Hale, he, he said the enchantment is too strong. Right. He can't see anymore. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. So the, so. so the spirit wins out. Joseph can't get it. Yeah. You think it's probably Isaac who's getting sick of Joseph being there. He doesn't want them in his house anymore. Is worried about his intentions with yeah. his daughter. But... In this time, Isaac Hale... Oh, Isaac says he was getting disenchanted. Right, right. But also, um, Stoll was probably spending a lot of money on this, right? He, like paying he, for diggers. And, and was, yeah. was Joseph... Was Joseph... Were Joseph and Joseph Sr. being paid by, by Josiah Stoll? Were they making money? How much? I don't know. But Joseph Smith did say in 1838 uh, in, the, in the Elder's Journal that... Yeah, I was a money digger, but I didn't get paid very much. Something like uh, fourteen dollars a day, something like that. Well, but they needed money. Ditch diggers at that time made twelve dollars a day on the on the on the canal digging right. the Erie Canal. They made like twelve dollars a day. So it's he didn't money. he didn't do anything except look in his hat and gets you know, 12 or $14 a day, whatever it was. I can't remember. And the but, family was desperate for money because they were about to lose their house. But they lost it anyway while they were gone. But 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 before they left to, to join Josiah Stoll, they were yeah. being threatened with losing the house. Yeah, so this was... They a, had to make money, right? This was a desperate thing, yes. Yeah, so money was at least part of their reason for going with Josiah Stoll. Yeah. Because they were getting paid, correct? Right. Okay. Um, now... But they were... Uh, Joseph Smith Sr., was probably hoping that Justin Smith Jr. will find the treasure. Find the treasure. And then that would solve, that would solve all of their yeah, problems. That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's what's going on. Is, and in your mind, was Joseph thinking he was actually going to find treasure? And was he believing that there really was treasure? In your mind, he was fooling people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. He... <laughs> 
he didn't see anything. Uh, but he's locked in. He's locked into this thing himself. You know, he's encouraged by his father. Do it, do this, do this, you know. And he's locked in. He can't get out of the role either if he wanted to. But he has no other thing to do. But Yeah, I mean, it's, it's probably a, a more enjoyable way to make money than actually digging or mm -hmm. going to work on a farm. Just looking into a hat and, and pretending they're spirits. It's probably a little bit more fun, a little bit less tedious from Joseph's perspective. Plus, he needs to make money, right? He, well, he, he, he needs to make money, yeah. Um, but it's his only gig. Yeah, it's his gig. <laughs> That's his gig. It's his only. Th it's his only thing. He okay. doesn't have anything else. So at really. some. So at some Except point, digging a well, maybe. Right. But so at some point, one of Josiah Stoll's cousins or nephews complains, turns him in. Is that right? Is that okay? Well, th this is a while later. Josiah Stoll, although there's this failure, hires Joseph Smith to keep on looking for treasure along the Susquehanna River closer to his house. And that's where they go? They go north, yeah. up the Susquehanna River. That's Bainbridge. South Bainbridge. Okay. They pass up, they go up, you know, along the uh, Susquehanna River. They pass Colesville, Joseph Knight Sr.'s farm. Joseph Smith, Jos Josiah Stoll knows Joseph Knight Sr. He goes up a little bit further, and where the river bends again, he... He stays with Josiah Stoll during the winter, going to school with his sons. And um, they, he gets his room and board there. And he also, on the side, looks for treasure for Josiah Stoll, more Spanish treasure in different locations. He looks for a salt mine in one place. When you get to the 1826 trial, the record actually names about five places Joseph Smith had dug for treasure along the Susquehanna River. Uh, one was uh, a lost treasure by a guy that died. You know, another one was a Spanish one. One was a salt mine on this hill along the Susquehanna River. Um, so, um, finally, Josiah Stoll's nephew, uh, put out a suit, uh, a lawsuit against him, a complaint, and they arrested Joseph Smith. Um, <clears throat> so the trial record is a really important record, and uh, it was written supposedly in the Justice of the Peace docket book, um, I'm in trouble with names, but... Doesn't uh, matter. <laughs> I know. Well, well, that's why they need to buy the book, <laughs> yeah. to get all the names. So uh, it was written there, and then Emily Pearsall uh, uh, tore it out of the uh, record book and took it to Utah, and it was published there. And a lot of people say, oh, it's fake, it's fake. You know, uh, even Hugh Nibley said it's the most damning evidence if it's real, blah, blah, blah. So... Uh, because it's a, it gives the testimony of the people, the actual, uh, not their words, it's not a transcript. It isn't called a transcript, but it's not word for word. But it, it summarizes their testimonies. Some are friendly, and some are not friendly towards Joseph Smith. Does the original document survive? No. Do copies of it survive? Only the publication of it in the newspaper. So a photograph of it. No, this is 1881. So a handwritten... 86, What would it have been? A handwritten rep Utah, re reproduction? Uh, no, it was just a type... They, type, they printed it in a newspaper. Okay, so somebody, re somebody read the original... It put it, yeah. And then just, and, and just transcribed or whatever the word would be... In the newspaper. Into the newspaper. In Utah. And, and we don't know what happened to the original... No, it's lost. And th there's ideas that might have burned in this one fire because this minister may, may have had it that was the editor of that paper. Uh, it's been published three times, actually. So three different, pe uh, two, two at least, were from the original, not reprinting. Okay, okay. Okay, so. I mean, some would say like Joseph Fielding Smith or his predecessor, Joseph F. Smith, would have thrown it away or burned it, right? Because it's, if it's damning evidence, 
if there were any GAs that got a hold of it, they probably may have wanted to just get rid of it. I'm just speculating. I don't know. I, I we don't know, but I wouldn't accuse anybody of doing that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so um, we the reason why we know it's not fake is because if somebody forged the document, they wouldn't have Josiah Stoll saying, "I have all the evidence." I need that. And, you know, Jonathan Thompson is another guy. There were belie- true believers in Joseph Smith. And they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't allow their testimony to, you know, like Josiah Stoll telling about Joseph Smith's remote viewing from Palmyra area, you know. They wouldn't put stuff in that kind of substantiates Joseph Smith's gifts. So, you know, it's not, it's not a forgery. It's some people try to say that it's, it's totally silly, but what happened is is that this publication in 1886 uh, had the cha- bill the charges at the bottom, and so all the question was on this transcript. Well, when Wesley Walters found the bills in the basement, and it gave the charges, uh, and it was exactly the charges on that publication in 1886, it substantiated the the trial. Now, some apologists have tried to question, oh, Wes forged it or something, but there's absolutely no evidence that that's a forgery or anything close to it. Uh, It's only like some internet apologists. So when was all this uncovered and and kind of substantiated, the the veracity of this trial (coughs) and the outcome of the trial? Around what year? Wes... uh, you, I don't know, 70. 1970s? Maybe, maybe even 60s, okay, late so, 60s. Okay, so so up until this had sort of gone down the memory hole of Mormonism, and, and it wasn't until it kind of got revitalized in the 1960s, 70s, that all of a sudden the GAs were kind of forced to admit that Joseph Smith really was a treasure. Yeah, it's, it's conceded by most scholars now. And this only, is... Only the stray... Uh, an internet apologist or will try to question it and, and apply that Wes changed it or something. Okay. And, and, um, and this would have led to Michael Quinn publishing Joseph Smith in the early magic world view or whatever that book. Uh, I think Mark Hoffman's forgeries, the salamander letter, uh, is what spurned the apologist and Mike Quinn's an apologist. He admits he's an apologist, right. an honest apologist right because there are <laughs> dishonest, <some> ones. <laughs> dishonest ones but uh uh okay yeah so anyway i think that because that's when quinn started giving these uh thing uh, uh talks at the uh sunstone that i mentioned before uh on magic and it was stunning he, he did stunning research he, he went a little overboard i thought in a few areas like witch covens being secret combinations, I, I don't follow that. But for the most part, it was stunning research at, at its time, and it and it uh, pushed you know the scholarship in that direction to be more honest. Right. The farms people hated him. Yeah. But they don't, they don't like anything except their <laughs> own stuff. So the important outcomes from the trial were what? What were the important outcomes? Okay. Now, the testimony is actually more important than the verdict. verdict. Okay. Okay. Because we have Josiah Stoll uh, uh, saying, uh, giving actual stories. See, Joseph Smith's defense was, I'm not a fake seer. I'm a real seer. And these guys will tell you so, right? (laughs) So Josiah Stoll, Jonathan Thompson... They got on and told their stories that they absolutely know this guy can find treasures, even though we can never dig them up. Um, and other people got on and said, oh, his, he was so fake, it was obvious, you know, when he did certain things like uh, hold a candle to uh, his stone and turn his back to a book and read it, you know, like a re- remote viewing behind his back. He's reading a book. Um, I mean, you know how he did that. I, you know, I can tell you how it could be done, but I can't tell you how he did it because there's not enough information. Mostly there's, there's not enough information to work some stuff out because you're reading the testimony of people that were fooled. <laughs> they don't have the information. They right. were fooled. Right. 
so pe- people try to tell me all the time about, oh, the guy did this magic trick and they'll describe it. And I go, that's not how it's, you didn't see that because that's not how he did it. Because if he did it that way, it would, that would be a miracle if he did it exactly how you described it. Usually they describe it how the magician wants them to think about what, how it really have how, what they think is he's really doing. But if a trained observer watches, you see all sorts of stuff that other people don't see. But so Josiah Stoll and the others are trying to tell you about what they saw. You, you just can't get the information. They've done studies uh, where they have studied people after, you know, a seance or after uh, some sort of illusion. And they always make it more difficult when they put it in writing so that the researcher afterwards could never work it out because it's impossible to work it out because they wrote it in such a way as to get the, you can't get the clues right, to right, work it out. Right. Anyway, so at any rate, um, Josiah Stoll tells this story that's totally fascinating and it's re- very revealing. And he said, Joseph Smith looked into a stone and he saw a treasure at the root of a stump of a tree. We went to that spot. We dug. Oh, and he, and he said, when he saw the treasure, there was a feather resting on the lid. So they dug down. They didn't find the treasure, but they found the feather. So <laughs> there's no way that that, you know, a feather could get like six feet. So Joseph predicted that there would be a feather in, in there. Well, the tre- you find the treasure, and on the lid would be a feather. Well, the treasure disappeared, but they found the feather. Okay. Well, the feather was planted. And you're thinking Joseph planted the feather. So what and that, that would fit with so his either, previous... So either previous. two things are possible. Right. You said this in the book. Yeah. <laughs> There's really slippery treasures. <laughs> that there, there was and a Joseph feather. And Joseph saw a feather. <laughs> and this is Quinn's. Quinn will take that part. He will say, just to be intellectually consistent, he will say... Yeah, there are. Tre- Why? Who are you to say there's no tre- slippery treasures? <laughs> you know, so. Uh, but that tells me that this guy is a conscious deceiver. That Joseph planted the feather, probably while digging, uh, and allowed Josiah to find it. You know, and um, to increase faith, he has to give a little bit of. You know, just like a, a confidence scheme works. The confidence scheme works like uh, Ansel Ransford. An, uh, I mean, Ransford um, <laughs> Rogers. Uh, he was a treasure digger that actually went to prison for it. Um, he would go into a town. Well, he would bury a few coins. And he would go into town, start bragging about his ability with a rod. Sooner or later, someone would go, you know, old man so-and-so, they didn't have banks. Old man so-and-so he died recently, and we believe he had uh, some treasure on his property somewhere. Do you think you could find it? And so uh, they would take the rod. He would go. He would find the few coins. This is like priming the well. Or, you know. So. Uh, and would Joseph have heard about these sort of techniques? Oh, yeah. 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 Okay. And so he'd have learned about this idea of planting evidence. Yeah, you got to ki- build the confidence. Like that. right. That's just the build the confidence. Okay. And it, they would, he would say, well, let's go into shares and make a, a company, right? And they would put their shares in money to to uh, so that the Rensford could go and get a better rod. He needs a better rod because it's a really difficult project. He needs d- more materials and he needs money. Give me money. Uh, and they would uh, invest, and he would disappear with the money. And that's all, like the music man. You know, you you roll into town, you sell everybody on a big brass band. They all pay their money in for the brass band, and then you skip town with the money. Mm. I mean, that's, that's the foundation of the con man, music man musical, mm-hmm. which sounds like a derivative of, of the types of schemes that w- yeah. were going on in the oh, early 1800s. Go, these are... Uh, okay. 
you know, these kind of tricks go back into okay. ancient times. Okay, so so the testimony uh, talks about the the feather. So that's one. That's one. Else? There's other stories of hit. They believe they hit the lid Top of, of the, the trunk. Treasure. Right. You know, whatever it was, who knows? But there was nothing there, and it disappeared. And their only explanation was that it must have moved by enchantment to another location. So they kept they 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 were able to maintain their belief in, you know, the core principles of money digging by making these uh, excuses for failure. Right. So people want to know what the, what the verdict or the outcome of the trial was. Okay, so uh, this is very controversial. Everybody debates. The Mormons hate if Joseph Smith was found guilty, you know, as if that would mean anything anyway. It wouldn't mean, it wouldn't mean anything if he was found guilty. But because he was 19, he was probably uh, let off. Uh, Something bail or. What? Well, he, he had already said he wanted to quit because it hurt his eyes. And <laughs> well, he was trying to he was trying to say that he never solicited. I right. never solicited. Yeah, they came to they me. Came, yeah, they yeah. came to me. Yeah. And uh, it hurt my eyes anyway. I was thinking of giving it up. And. Uh, so being a minor uh, and somebody wanted to give it up, they decided to let him off. Now, my reconstruction using um, the handbills that Wes found, uh, Philip DeZang was, a, was the constable. And when you look down his itemized uh, bill to the county, it has uh, uh, like a uh, warrant, you know, for, or uh, a warrant subpoenas you know it's listing costs and it has one traveling 10 miles um i forget the, the exact words but traveling 10 miles and the cost and it's just put it that way well i believe that extra mileage nobody can explain i mean uh truman i mean not truman matson Gordon Metzen has try doesn't have an explanation for it. Says, "Oh, it must be a mistake or some sort of thing." Well, that ten miles, I believe, is where they escorted him out of the county into to to uh, Joseph Knight Senior's farm is ten miles south of. And basically, there. if he if he promises not to do it again, <clears throat> he's nineteen. He's not twenty yet. Well, one of, one of the you one know of we'll the, let him go. Yeah, one of the things is that they, you know they could. They could imprison you. They could charge you money, or they can uh, order you out of the county for six months. So, if he had uh, really escaped, it, this is an argument. Some apologists. How? Why would he go back there and be married? Uh, you know, and hang around in eighteen twenty-seven. Yeah, yeah. To Emma, he go. He gets married in the county by one of the justices of the peace. He does. So my. My reconstruction is that they escorted him out and said the penalty is that you don't return for six months. And so it was after six months that he finally returned and when he got married. And the sense I get from your book is that this was a really low point for Joseph, the the trial and the verdict, that, that it was a low point. Is that, am I remembering that right? Yeah, well. It's he, shaming. It's, what, what is yeah, it? Yeah, well. Yeah, he was. He could see that his future as a money digger was limited. <laughs> because <laughs> because he just got caught, and then the next time <laughs> it might not be so easy. Um. So during the trial, is a really neat uh, quote about Joseph Smith Senior by uh, um, William D. Purple. William D. Purple was a physician nearby. And uh, in 1877, he wrote a reminiscence of this trial and said that Joseph Smith Sr. Uh, was questioned on the witness stand and that he had said that he would hope that his son would find a better uh, outlet for his gift, that he wouldn't use it to find filthy lucre and uh, that the Almighty will show him what to do with his gift. So that was kind of a opening of a do uh, door. 
a thought. The other thing that happened was when he he went to he married Emma. He went back. He worked with on Josiah Stoll's farm for a while. Then went down, got Emma. They kind of eloped because Joseph. I mean, uh, Isaac was Isaac, Isaac wasn't, Hale wasn't. He didn't want to, Joseph Smith marrying his daughter, and uh, especially because he was a money digger. They, but they also, left. you said because he mistreated his dad sometimes. I think. Oh, he he, yeah, saucy. He got yeah. saucy with the. And you argue because he was trying to get his dad to to stop doing the treasure digging, which is interesting because then you just quoted his dad saying he needs to use his special powers in another way. Yeah. So <laughs> so they're turning. They're turning. Yeah. There's a turning. Uh, hey, this thing isn't going to last much longer. The gig is up. G- they, uh, they already failed to save the ho- home. When they f- they went home, they found out they, they lost the farm anyway. And Lucy wasn't happy about that. <laughs> no. Uh, no, well, she didn't. Uh, I believe she was furious about some things Joseph Sr. did and believed. Yeah. About his universalism is one of them, but his money digging. Yeah. And, uh, not money didn't per se, but how it preoccupied him so much that you were gone when we lost the farm. You weren't here. We had this horrible thing with the landlord, you know, and sheriff, and you weren't here. You were off money digging, you know. Right. So, but nobody's going to air their laundry, especially the Smiths. But, <laughs> um, so uh, he marries Emma and goes back to Manchester and lives with his mother for a while. Marries her in 1827? It's January. 1827. 1827. Okay. They, and, and, and they lived there for... When does he promise Isaac? When does he promise Isaac he's going to stop the treasure okay. digging and he apologizes? Is that before or after so, the marriage? After. So they eloped. Okay, they elope. They go live with the Smiths jo- for a while. Josiah Stoll r- right. uh, drove him in his wagon uh, to Manchester. Whoops. Or his daughters or something like that. Yeah. No, not was yet. It? Okay, okay. Well, they were they were there at the wedding. Okay. Okay. Um, but uh, so um, they came back to Manchester and lived with uh, Lucy Smith and Joseph Senior. They're in the frame house. Uh, Hiram is in the cabin, and um, then. They go back to get uh, Emma's furniture, and they take uh, Peter Ingersoll, their neighbor, and they go back, and Isaac and Joseph Smith have this very emotional confrontation, and the old man is crying his eyes out, you've stolen my daughter. Wait, was this when he fools Ingersoll to pay for the trip? No, that was before. That was this. a disturbing little thing. Oh, really? To no. me, just that he would, didn't he recruit someone? Yeah. Oh, that, that's when he wanted to propose to Emma. Right. Yeah, in your book, okay. he gets back to New York, he's like, he gets back to his home, he wants to propose to Emma, but he doesn't have the money to do it. Right. So he fools some dude into going with him and paying Peter Anderson under the guise that it's a treasure digging pursuit, that he's going to make money out of the deal. That seemed blatantly deceptive. If not, if all the other stuff hadn't been, am I getting that right? Did he? Yeah, he went back, and he needed someone to help pay the way, but he also needed someone to vouch for yeah. his integrity, right? <laughs> to with, Isaac with Hale, Isaac, probably. Yeah. yeah, and uh, and he just wanted to keep tabs with Emma, but he did eventually, um. Get a job with Joseph, uh, Joseph Knight Sr. No, but he tells that dude, I'm going to help you find treasure. And that's how yeah, he convinces that's him. That's how he lured to, him there. To lure him to pay for the trip down right. to I propose know where there's a treasure. You know, and and we'll find it after we deal with Emma. And, a gold and, bar as big as your leg. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty, that was pretty gross. I didn't like that oh, story. <laughs> manipulating people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so he goes to Isaac. Isaac's not down with it, so he kind of elopes with them. They both cry. And and Joseph Smith very tearfully said he's going to give up money digging. Well, that came later, right? That came after he comes back. Yeah, he comes back so he, to get Emma's furniture after right, he's so married. He, let me just make sure. So he steals <laughs> Emma. They elope. Um, Josiah Stoll helps with that. They go back and live with the Smiths for a while. And then he needs to return to get the furniture. And that's when he returns 
and this event and happens. the confrontation. Okay, and that what is that? Which is very a very important uh, event uh, was that <clears throat> Isaac Hale's all emotional, and so is Joseph Smith and Peter Ingersoll, the neighbor that went with uh, Joseph and uh, Emma, tells the story, and Isaac Hale tells the story also, and it's pretty close the same, and. Uh, it was that Joe Smith promised to give up money digging. He's done with it. Although later, when he came back and he started translating the Book of Mormon with the stone in the hat, they thought, well, I thought he was giving this seeing stuff up. But evidently, Joseph Smith uh, thought of the t- things as two different uh, events, two but, different But is it safe to say that that confrontation with Isaac was yet again another admission that he was he was basically admitting that his treasure digging stuff was fraudulent and and not godly and was kind of corrupt is that fair to say well i think peter ingersoll says that he said i could never i could never see in the stone anyway so uh i don't know about that part but it's not necessary to decide that whether he he's confessing uh, being fraud or not? Why that sounds that sounds important. <laughs> well, it's he, Peter Ingersoll. No, I'm just saying if, if if Joseph were at some point to admit, yeah, multiple times that what he was doing was fooling people, mm-hmm. that speaks to his credibility. But it also addresses this weird Richard Bushman theory that I read in Joseph Smith and the Beginnings of Early Mormonism that that. This treasure digging phase was Joseph experimenting with his special powers. That, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that that he actually did have powers, and he was actually experimenting with them in the treasure digging phase, but that he didn't come to fully use and and, and exploit yeah. his true God given powers until later. That is all bunk. If Joseph is admitting, you know, in multiple occasions that he was actually just fooling people the whole time. Yeah, which well, is most I would, likely. I, I w- <laughs> I wouldn't uh, put that argument to re- resting just on the idea that he confessed being a, a fraud. Um, There's more evidence you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> more important <laughs> evidence than Peter Ingersoll. I don't know if if it's if he's a, saying the truth or not. Uh, I, I, I kind of doubt. Why would Joe Smith uh, admit that he's a fraud? I mean, it's possible. He could admit he was a fraud because he didn't know what was next. But um, so. Okay. I just kind of like, uh, I don't need to, uh, you know, latch onto those little things like that. Because there's there's other times where he supposedly said the same thing uh, that he, oh, he can never, he can't see in the stone anyway. But But for you, but for you, the most compelling evidence that he was intentionally fooling people is just your secular non-magic worldview, or are there other evidences? Oh, well, yeah. The, the feather. Fe- the feather, the... Uh, <coughs> yeah, my secular view that treasures don't slide through the earth. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that that's probably uh, major, but... Now, you know, he, he made out that the stone actually worked in and of itself. It had magical properties. That's magic, you know. So uh, <clears throat> other people tried to uh, modernize it because we know a little bit more about the physical universe. But um, that it, he was just using the stone is just a focal point and that it's all happening in his head anyway. Um, but um, he didn't find any treasures. Yeah, that's another one. <laughs> um, he's act. He's you know the walking like a duck. Uh, you know, right. walking like a duck thing. But he's following all these charlatans. That he's came doing all the same moves that, that all the are, charlatans are doing. That and, has nothing to do with religion, really. Yeah. No. Um, um, now and then you ask, you know, how could he learn to actually see and translate the Book of Mormon through fraudulent? Practice practicing as a fraud. That's our next segment. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like right. If the stone oh. didn't find any treasures, why does it all of a sudden work when he needs to <laughs> translate the plates? <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, but the answer is that it's because he already had charisma 
coming through the stone. His authority and his charisma. When people looked at him, they saw him as a seer. And that power and authority and charisma that he earned as a treasure seer, which was Josiah Stoll, uh, Joseph Knight Sr., uh, Martin Harris, family members, his dad especially believed that he had this, this, this ability. Yeah, and that's, to me, that's one of the most powerful things that I'm reading from your book is it blew my mind that Josiah Stoll for three years prior had been trying and failing, trying and failing, spending all this money and time. He clearly, in spite of so many people failing him, was still believing that there was treasure and still willing to hire Joseph. Mm -hmm. And then after the silver mine fails near Isaac Hale, he's still employing Joseph for another several months yeah. to find and not find four or five other treasures and digs. It just goes to show, number one, that people are desperate to believe in magic and superstitious or religious stuff. And secondly, that Joseph clearly learned that he had the power to get people to believe in his, he had the power and ability to, be, to get people to believe that he had power and abilities even when he was never able to deliver the goods. That's it. And that, that, that's what he's learning. Th that was the learning. <laughs> he isn't learning how to use a stone. He's <laughs> he, learning how to make people believe he uses a stone. With power, yeah. The relationship between the believer and the leader and the follower is symbiotic. They create him. Yeah, yeah. And he is trapped in their need for him. Yeah. So that's why I always turn it around on the followers. Yeah, we they create are, the prophets. They are responsible for, you know. We created yeah. Joseph Smith. We created Mormonism. Right. Out of our desperate, out of our discomfort with death, out of our discomfort with instability and chaos and pain and suffering, we created Joseph Smith. We created Mormonism because otherwise we have to live in this meaningless, dark, chaotic world where there's pain and suffering and no sense mm -hmm. of it all. So the... True believer needs it to be true, not want it, not wish it. They need it. And that's why I don't try to bother them. I don't care about bothering them. If I have any effect at all on anybody, it would be someone that's undecided, somebody that feels trapped like I was when I was young. I didn't know enough to, to make the decision. You know, I doubted myself. So it took so the people that if I communicate with anybody, which isn't my main goal, but if my work has any uh, side effects, it would be towards people that feel trapped because they don't know enough and need more information to decide for themselves what they, to do with their lives. Right. I would never decide for them. Right. That makes sense. All right. Well, I think I think that concludes our discussion of treasure digging. Oh, okay. So we're two. We're about two hours in. <laughs> um, <coughs> so we me. hope we <clears throat> hope you've enjoyed that treatment of treasure digging as a part of our new truth claim series on Mormon stories. Check out mormonstories.org/treasure for the essay that we've put together um, on Joseph Smith's treasure digging. And a billboard will be coming out soon on I-15 asking, was Joseph Smith the treasure digger? Question mark. Um, and we're hoping to make pe more people aware that he was, in fact, a treasure digger. And that this is very much, uh, uh, it's not just some odd, interesting tidbit of information. This was his tutelage into the next phase of his career as either a prophet or a charlatan or some combination of the two, depending on your beliefs, this leads to the Book of Mormon. And so that's our very next segment, which is how Joseph Smith created the Book of Mormon. So thank you for joining us. I'm not going to end this Facebook feed, but I am going to, we're going to end this episode, but join us uh, right back uh, immediately with the next segment of our Dan Vogel interview, where Dan Vogel is going to tell us how Joseph Smith created the Book of Mormon based on his theory and his feedback.